what excited me tremendously was out of the Navy with this new invisible world where we suddenly had some alloys of steel. And we knew that while we had exactly the same number of guns, the same size guns as the enemy, the same tonnage ship, we had a steel alloy in our guns which made it possible to fire accurately a thousand yards further than he could. So when he got within our range, you let him have it and he never got a chance. This became the secret weapon of World War I was alloy, but with the invisible capabilities that suddenly were coming along. Very easy to keep them secret. <laughs> They've not as yet even got out of society really thinking it's going. Anyway, I said, I, you know, I'm trained in a new world with the range of electronics. I've got, if you want to get a message across the Atlantic yesterday, I had to send a ship. Now I can talk across the 200 pounds of material I'm talking across the Atlantic. <coughs> I said, there's some totally here, a very good possibility of doing so much with <coughs> so little. We might someday be able to take care of everybody and demonstrate to the scientists, the, the social scientists, the economists, were thrilled by Malthus because they, they, were, they were very jealous of the hard sciences having found some generalized mathematical laws. They hoped this was a law. They hoped this was a generalization. And it still is the, the model of all economists is fundamental skeptic. So I said, I can see there's a possibility someday we might be able to really break down the, cap the working assumption is not enough to go around. And I said, the place where it could be most definitely demonstrated would be in environment controls for human beings because on the land we still do it piling up stone <laughs> from the old fortress days. One environment control on the sea, it couldn't be made out of stone, it'd sink right away, it'd break all up. <laughs> we have to have tension capability now, and all the compression capability of yesterday's stone is the way all engineering is still conducted now, basically with the figure engineering analysis today still is a compressional continuity advantaged to some extent by tension holding it together. But they count on the compressional continuity. A ship at sea, going to be, it's, a, it's a beam this minute between two waves. Next minute it's a, it's a cantilever trying to do this. So engineering advanced very rapidly at sea but very much more rapidly in the sky. So I saw that by 1927, by I could see there's a chance with somewhere in the sea and, and the sky technology we might be able to really do so much with so little. We might be able to take care of everybody. So that became my grand strategy for 55 years. What impressed me above all in relation to compression was the following. We have the, the Greek column, I call slenderness ratio. <coughs> 18 diameters high and, and then you want to go over. With the compression, you want to bend, mm -hmm. but the tension wants to stay down. And we have today with steel, we get up to 40 diameters high and then bends over. But in tension, there's no, no cross section limit to length. If you get a better alloy, you make it longer and longer and thinner and thinner. And I said, looks as though I can make a, get better alloys and get longer and longer suspension bridges, with slender and slender cables, and pushing great distance in no, show, no cross section at all. I said, is that nonsense? I said, no, uh, there, there's, you can fly your plane between the moon and the earth, and uh, there's a center of gravity. And, uh, I said, the whole universe being held together. There's a, what you call a tensional integrity instead of a compressional integrity of all building of humans on our planet. And the condition reflected on that are very, very powerful. Anyway, mm -hmm. I saw that if I want to, <coughs> I can take a steel rod, one inch, one eighth of an inch in diameter and three feet long, put between my fingers, bends very readily. I would take a number of those rods and close pack them in circles in a hexagon bundle. I'm going to make that, let's say, up to a six inch bundle <laughs> diameter, hexagon, all closely packed to each other. I put strapping of tension around them. And on the ends, I make hexagonal forged steel caps that fit on the ends to hold them tight. And I put this in a hydraulic press using it as a column. We know that each one of those rods can bend, but they can't bend towards each other because they're closest packing. The only thing to do is bend away from each other. So you find they start to do that, and that immediately stretches the tension that was bound around them. If we have enough general flexibility here, we always, in loading a column, try to load what you call its neutral axis, so it won't want to bend one way or the other. 
And I keep loading this, it gets to be more and more like a cigar, this hydraulic press. Finally, get to the spherical condition. A sphere, every axis is a neutral axis. So I found nature is using, na nature in an optimum compression was spherical. So I saw these planets and so forth, and these spherical, and it worked all the spherical groups, atoms and so on. I said, is humanity inherently barred from thinking in this way that nature is of having what I call discontinuous compression, continuous tension? Then I called it tension on integrity, and then I shortened it up to a sense of many times to, te to tense integrity. I found that it was possible for man, for humans to make not just a wire wheel in a plane, but to make it in the, in the spherical. And I'll hold that up here. I'm going to could you take this off the top? Could you take this off the top? Could I just want to, I want to drop it so that you can see it will bounce. It bounces like a basketball. Now, what you're looking at, there's the wooden, wooden sticks, and there's a little daycron thread that you use to clean your teeth. No, no stick touches another stick. Here you have a building now with no brick touches another brick. They're held together only in tension. And it looks, it looks perplexing, but I'm going to explain it to you so you understand it really very simply. When you put air into a basketball and pump it, pumping it in, you keep crowding molecules in there, and they want to get out of the system. So they keep moving, and they hit the skin. They don't go to the center of the ball and try to explode out of it. You don't get the series of explosions pulsing that way. They're all caroming around like that. Now there's something called action, every action having a reaction. You have two swimmers. You have a swimmer in a, in a tank. He gets the end of the tank and doubles up his leg and shoves it off in the wall. He gets a beautiful, uses the inertia to give him great propulsion. You have two swimmers meet in the middle of the tank, double up their legs, put their feet against each other, shove off in the opposite directions, getting the same advantage with the walls, the same weight. That's what engineer calls every action having reaction. What you're looking at is each one of these sticks here is a pair of molecules going to opposite ways. And they're hitting the skin here. And they just keep bouncing around, keep pushing the skin outwardly. So all these sticks are outward forces and, and they're held together in tension. You could have a fishing net, an enormous fishing net, where the netting was such that no fish could get out and the fish would keep hitting in all directions. But here we have exactly the discrete netting. We don't have just a whole lot of netting. We have exactly the netting only where it should be. We have exactly understand where things want to be. Now looking at that, unit. If I, incidentally, if I have a turnbuckle, I try this like a music instrument. If I tighten one of them, they're all tight exactly the same. There's a tune, unique tuning for this particular set. All loads are completely distributed. There's no slack in there anywhere. <laughs> Absolutely even distributed. So, That became then what I call them the tenth century. Now you notice the pentagon. There are twelve pentagons here. Those are the twelve corners of the icosahedron. And remember, the icosahedron gave me the most volume with the least structural investment. So here then is the tenth century icosahedron, giving me by far the most structural capability with the least possible investment, which is what I was looking for. If I was going to do so much with Fazil, we'd be able to take care of everybody. Each one of those cords, let's say this cord here, is the cord of a central angle. <laughs> this being the cord, and this is where the sphere is. We have what we call the arc altitude between the arc and the cord. As you increase the frequency of modular subdivision, more and more members, we get smaller and smaller central angles. As you do, we decrease the arc altitude. We finally get to a point where the, the, just the, the thickness of the material you have to make it out of touches the other piece. <coughs> That's all, all my geodesic domes are simply that there. Everything is where it wants to be and just fasten it there. Nothing is faster than shear. You pull, if you're pulling this thing, the whole thing expands symmetrically, contracts symmetrically. Everything is exactly where it wants to be and you freeze it there. That's what we call a geodesic dome because it's 
then it, its whole integrity, its tension, is no limit of, of spans. It has nothing to do with interior columns of any kind whatsoever. Nothing pushing things out. There's no central explosion of that kind. This meant then I could get to any any size domes. When I did the first geodesic dome, the two largest domes in the world were both in Rome, the St. Peter's and the Pantheon, both 150 feet. And today we're getting out, we're, we're, we're closing, uh, closing whole cities and so forth. It's going to be a very easy thing to do. Now, every time you double the length of a ship, the sea, you have four times by surface, you have eight times the bottom. So they learned long ago, when we double the length of the ship, you had eight times the payload, but only four times the surface, which you, you have the amount of friction per payload. So it pays to build bigger and bigger ships. Same thing happens with my dome spheres. Every time I double the size of a dome, I have four times the surface, I have eight times the volume. Every time I double, then I have eight times the mole number of molecules of atmosphere inside, but only four times my surface. So every time I double, I have the amount of surface which an interior molecule of atmosphere can gain or lose heat. So the thermal efficiency goes up very, very rapidly, as it does with, with icebergs. Icebergs melt very slow, enormous mass, can't melt, melt any faster than get heat through the surface. But as they do melt, the bottom gets smaller and the velocity is the third power, and the surface only velocity is the second power, so they melt faster and faster. If I get the end of that cube goes out like that. Now, I want you to have a little feeling about the strategies I'm using and things I'm talking about. The I had quite a lot of geodesic tombs out in the uh, in the there are now over three hundred thousand around the world. But the time when Watson, Crick, and Wilkerson discovered DNA, RNA, we, there was a Dr. Klug at Burbank, London University, and now a Cavendish laboratory. Klug was working on the protein shells of the virus to try to understand what contained this very extraordinary message. And he found, using X-ray diffraction, he was getting patterns of nodes, and he said, he wrote to me and said, pictures I've seen in geodesic domes, the nodes seem to correspond very much with what I'm finding out here. So I was able to tell him that the mathematics of these nodes was such that when I'm dealing in the, when I'm dealing in the icosahedron, I'm dealing in fiveness. <laughs> the number, prime number five is in there. I, if I take spheres in closest packing around one sphere, you can get six around one in a plane and three on top, three in the bottom. Mm -hmm. You get twelve with closer packing around them. If you do, you're going to find eight triangles and six squares, interstices. Super. I put another layer exactly on there, and instead of being twelve, there'll be forty-two. And there will be the eight triangles and six squares, just as neat as it can be. Make another mm -hmm. layer, and there's ninety-two. And then another layer, 162, 252. You find that the numbers of those, I'll give you a layer, they always end in number two. I found that nature arranged to have two in every layer for spin, because every system has to have that spin ability. It's a fundamental freedom. When you take care of your 12 degrees of freedom, there it is. So see, in addition to the spin ability, she had a second power. Had the number, if I took away 12, that me 10, 42, 40, 92, 90. If I divide that by 10, which is the prime number 5 is in here, then it came out numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. In other words, this frequency of modulus subdivision is the second power times 10 plus 2. So I was able to write to Klug and tell him that the numbers of the nodes would always be that. And then about three years later, the World virologists had a, their first world meeting at Cold Spring Harbor in Long Island, New York, and they had, as the last year, the New York Herald Tribune being published as the New York Herald Tribune in New York. And they had the whole complete front page covered with the, with the virologists' work, but particularly pictures about what I just gave those spheres close back around one, and my formula, which had given, but, but what I had discovered then, as the most economical way of closing <laughs> volumes, energy was exactly what nature is using to control 
this most extraordinary design of all of our biology, all of our ecology. Now, I'd like now to use some slides, because I have to have lights out, and will you run the slides for me, Shirley? Yes. You have the button? Somebody, can somebody yes. run the slides for me, so I yes. won't have to yes. run them Mark, tell them that. Yes. 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 If yes. I was going to, <coughs> if I was going to be dealing in total spaceship Earth, total resources and so forth, I needed very badly to have a good map of the world. And this is, this is, about in, I don't know whether you have, uh, this, this is from a New York high school wall, and this is what's <coughs> called the classic world map, the Mercator map, and I don't suppose any of you look, feel very shocked at looking at it, but at any rate, Greenland is bigger than South America, which is an absolute lie, and we think nothing of telling our children that Greenland is bigger than, uh, than South America. North America is bigger than Africa, which is a lie, and there's no Antarctic. And this part of Russia seems to be 25,000 miles, that part of Russia only a mile apart. So it's not a very good kind of map. I wanted very much to have a really good map, and I found a way of developing one. May I have the next picture, please? <coughs> I have six stainless steel straps here. Each is all the same length. Three of them put together as, a uh, as an equilateral angular triangle. And three of them are the perpendicular bisectors, bisectors of the triangle. You can see that all right, can't you? Down here I have a slotting <coughs> where this strap goes through here and out here again. And there are three stop points. If I then increase the, if I pull on that slider, it becomes this form. Pull in a little more from the second hole and becomes this form, the third form. This makes a spherical tetrahedron. This makes a spherical octahedron. <coughs> this makes a spherical icosahedron. Like Thank you. You can see a basic triangle here. <coughs> here, here it is. There are 20, 20 of them here. I took 32 of these and they made up all this spherical all this triangle structures of the universe. Structural systems all made from one triangle. I didn't have, to, uh, doing what I'm doing, this length of edge remains absolutely constant. We don't change our uniform boundary scale in any way. <coughs> Furthermore, <coughs> this perpendicular, the 90 degrees remains 90 degrees. The 60 degrees, 60 degrees remains exactly the same. The only thing that varies is down this corner right here. For the spherical uh, 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 tetrahedron, this is 90, 60, 60. 90, 45, 30. Uh, 45, 45. But here we have 90, 60, 36. This is 30 degrees, and on the <coughs> 36 degrees. There's spherical excess of 6 degrees, each of 120 corners. Those 120 corners simply contract locally in such a manner there's no visible distortion of the relative shape or size of any of my parts. May I have the next picture, please? <coughs> You're now seeing your whole world at once without any visible distortion of the relative shape or size of any of the parts. Not only that, but you're seeing it without any breaks in the continental contours. We have one world island and one world ocean. The colors are the relative temperatures, but in the terms of the cold, you can see, this is down here, here is the equator going through here, here's the equator going through here, and here's the equator going through here. Ninety percent, there are one hundred white dots, each one is one percent of humanity, probably located for Ninety percent of humanity lives north of the equator. <laughs> And those who live south of the crater live pretty close to the crater. There's almost nobody in this southern hemisphere out there. <coughs> now, at the, I'm going to give you some more about the later. This is then um, equatorial, equatorial and hot. <coughs> the cold pole of the northern hemisphere is here because our waters 
change, hold their temperatures more steadily than any other substance, so that it doesn't get as cold over the water as it does over the dry land. So the northern hemisphere cold pole is right here, not at the North Pole. And <coughs> we have then this is Vek Poyansk in Russia. On an August noon time, it'll get, and, and, and August, it'll get to be as warm as equatorial Africa. But equatorial Africa never gets cold the way Vek Poyansk does. This has an enormous annual variation, <laughs> over 125 degrees annual variation. And here the equator is going to get about 20 degrees annual variation. So the, the colder it gets, the more annual variation, which means each of the variations is a different environment. <laughs> if you were living near Lake Victoria in Africa, you want to get the other side, you find there's a long way to get, if you rent a boat, you find wood floats. <laughs> if you live, live by, like, by cow in, in eastern uh, Russia, you will rent a boat in the summer, but you invent sleds and, and skates in the winter. As you're not more inventive, but you have to be more inventive if you don't survive. And I find that the, 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 this explains a great deal of the technological development on, on our planet. I find that the, those to the thermal north have always run the long military campaigns. They have more hardware, they have more natural recourse to, to develop in technology. Now the next thing, you tend to think, I'm sure, go north, go warm, go south, go, go north, go cold, go south, go warm. That's sort of natural way of thinking. But and that is exactly the way Napoleon thought. Napoleon said, if I stay in my own latitude and go east into Russia, I could have a bad winter, but by and large, my experience here is exactly what I'll have in Russia. And he was completely licked by it. And he was thought that Hitler was a scientist who found more, but they had, didn't look at this kind of map of mine. Hitler had what he called John Mark Easton, and he, he went to the east, and the locomotives froze up, all his greasy froze up, and so forth. He was licked by the coal. Because here's Portugal, the red. In Europe, you go east to the coal pole. These, these are, these are the, the, the thermal latitudes. <laughs> Once you realize what extraordinary kind of pattern that is, it's not the way people tended to think militarily, but there it is. And, and they did not spot it in World War II. Now, with this kind of map, you begin to see things in very powerful ways. And may I have the next picture, please? This is the same piece of the map rearranged with the water at the center instead of having the land at the center. <laughs> that is the Antarctic. And I spoke to you, incidentally, about taking a ship around the roaring forest here. We have our Earth revolving west to east. But we also have the waters of the southern hemisphere go around faster than the physically Earth. Then the air goes around even faster still. We have the, the southern jet stream going around there. You see where the great ice got driven through with making its horn in. All right? This is a picture of the British Empire, which was able to last for so long. They are entirely interested in ships and, and the control of the lines of supply. They saw all the people around here in the Northern Hemisphere. They were very remote from one another. They controlled the sea lanes between them, make enormous wealth out of just handling the traffic. But they said, Admiral Mahan in the United States became very famous all of a sudden because he discovered that the British had discovered very long time ago there was only one ocean. We tend to talk about Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and so forth. And the British discovered only one ocean. Here it is. And it had bays in the Atlantic, it had a bay, and the Atlantic and, and the Pacific and, and the Indian Ocean. So all you have to do is get down the Roaring Forties here and zip into the Atlantic. Yeah. The Roaring Forties zip into the Indian Ocean. And all they have to do is then control Southeast Africa right there, Australia, New Zealand, and the Falklands. Yeah. This is a picture you're looking at. It's the British Empire and it was never published because they were not interested in anybody seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to bring us up to the present moment. I'd like to discuss something about our day. I'm going to go through a history of, of revolution and revolutions. For an incredible period of time, humans on our planet here, not knowing about any others, any remote places, they only know their own locale the, where they can get around. And they find a place where food grows and they guard it. 
and they find themselves being invented, invaded by other people not so lucky, been brought it down one way or another, and he's going to, somebody's going to die, so defense is all out. They give everything to defense. The sort of fundamental mandate goes to the leader that if you're being challenged for your life, life livelihood, you give your life. <coughs> anyway, that's a long time pattern in politics. Now, we have suddenly, and you had to be near that food, or it would rot. So we, live, we have the kind of pattern we have here in France of uh, everybody living in the village, but going out to farm. You have to be very near to your food and on your ability to trade it. Now, suddenly came the tin can. And the tin, tinning of uh, the steel can, tin steel can, suddenly preserved the food that used to rot. And now it could suddenly reach people anywhere completely changed the pattern of survival of humanity. To do that, you had to go to the Malay Straits, let's say in, in the United States, go to the Malay Straits for your tin, might go to Masabi in Minnesota for your iron, and went to, to uh, southern Russia for your manganese. To make this one telephone instrument today, you had to get materials from three different continents. We don't have the telephone. Of this entirely new, this got brought about World War I. <laughs> because these new resources were not under the farms at all, nothing to do with the old capitalism, who owns the land. It was entirely new game. As I say, it brought about World War I, and who would control the metals where they existed in the mines. We have then, and incidentally, we've now come to a point where nobody realized that the, they knew that the peas rotted, <laughs> but the metal didn't rot and began to discover that you could re rec recover it and recycle it. And those who owned the mines didn't like that. <laughs> so there was a great pain in the neck to, the, to those who got into metal capitalism. Anyway, today, 85% of all the copper comes out of scrap <laughs> in our production. And it's, it's about 70% of all our steel. We're at a point where we don't have to do any more mining whatsoever. The, the metal's coming around. And in the meantime, we're going to do so much more, so much less. So ne never going to have to, and every time they come around, they, they average recycling every 22 years. For every 22 years we have a chance to take care of many more people, much higher standard living, with the, what they call the feminization of doing more with less. And that, and that great like magnetic spectrum. Now, on this picture here, we have then come back to 1917 and the Russian Revolution. And the Russians, in their revolution, thought of revolution as they'd always thought about it, as the serfs displaced, everybody displacing the landlord. <laughs> and they got out of the farms and they found this didn't distribute the foods, and by the, because by this time, because of tin cans, a lot of people in the cities, very many people were dying of starvation, the thing wasn't working. So they muddled around for about six years, then Stalin, very much the pain of the Leninists and, 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 and Marxists, said we're going to have to have industrialization that the rest of the world has, because we've got a World War II coming. So they then set up the five-year plans. And five
all frozen. There were radiant miners here. There's practically no place you can get into Russia to subvert the people to say, how can you put up with all this starvation? So they will hold people their things together and so held it through the World War II and they hope after the war is over that they'll be able to turn their productivity in their people to prove that they now could produce a standard of living equal to that of the Western world and the capitalist world. In the meantime, in management, what had happened, time of the American Revolution, we have Washington and Jefferson, the great backers of the American Revolution, and after the war, war, world, revolution, world Revolution was over, the early 70, 1775, Alexander Hamilton in the American Congress set about persuading and succeeded in persuading the Congress. It was not the intention of those backing the American Revolution that the government so constituted should have any capital or any money. He said, capital belongs to, to that's a private phenomenon. Wealth is something belongs to, only to private, belongs to great landowners, and the American government will have to borrow from the land banks of, of the rich when they need money and, and pay them back with interest. So that, they, that was agreed on. We come then to the people in America <coughs> earning their livings, didn't want to put their money under their mattresses or whatever. They said, save this place in the backs of the rich people. You can see all the bars in the back, on the windows and all those vaults in there. That's the place to put our money. So they kept putting it there. And everything held up until the great crash in 1929 and turned out there was not no money in the banks. <laughs> At this point, the, the New Deal coming in, everything completely stopped. And they said, we find that America still want to put their money in the bank. <laughs> but they want a bank where it's not going to go bust. So we the people don't have to guarantee our bank account, which was socialism. But it was not enough understood about what socialism was. That seemed to feel all right to people, but they didn't realize interpreted as being socialism. So the <coughs> New Deal had to become very deceptive about the socialism. What they did, they said, every great nation such as ours has to have national defense. And you can't have the national defense without steel, without electrical manufacturing and so forth. So they took the prime contractors who would produce the weapons and produce everything that would be necessary for war and, made, and they socialized them. They set up what they call the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the, billion, the first billion dollar corporation in history, and they then gave the United States Steel, for instance, $85 million worth of new machinery, which today would be around three, three billion. In other words, they completely socialized the corporation and they gave them orders that led to, to getting ready for World War II. And once they had a government order, they could, they could then borrow money from the banks, pay the wages, and get the money in circulation. So the, this is a hidden form of socialism by socializing the corporations. With World War II over, <laughs> the, uh, Eisenhower discovered what he called the industrial military complex, which was that we had, the, the government had really an obligation to keep those big corporations going. So they said, the only way you can do it is invent a World War III. They're going to call it the Cold War and do through puppeting and so forth. And, and, and with the time, we'll try not to actually let it get a hot end, but we'll have to have a commitment to be ordering all these musicians from the big corporation. Russians said, Who are you going to fight? And said, We're going to fight you. And Russians said, I thought, We thought you were our allies. And no, you're not. You're our enemy from now on. And this meant that the Russians could not turn their productivity on their people. And this was terrifically bad because the standard of living with World War II, over oh, an enormous amount of technology had been developed. And it was a, a, a most really annoyingly good way of living seemed to be operating in the Western world, and, and their people were having to go without. <laughs> so they did, they got up psychic guerrilla warfare, did everything they could to mess that up, looking at any rate. I was put on a committee, gotten up by people in, in America and the Ru Russian Academy of Sciences called the Dartmouth Conference where we discussed, we would meet in Russia and then America to discuss all the known existing problems existing between the two countries, hopefully to be able to smooth some things out. At any rate, on the committee I was on, there were military experts, all right, and there, but there were very rich men like David Rockefeller and Norm, Norton Simon and so forth. And these our meetings with the Russians, I really learned a whole lot. At the official meetings, everybody was absolutely hard, stuck to lines. But we'd lived together in a ho hotel, and we they had, were only four considered a table, 
and, and they immediately had an interpreter, so you would go and sit with the Russians, and, uh, and we, off the official table, we tried to discuss things, and there were so, sometimes some hope. Anyway, <coughs> I learned a great deal from the Russians about their viewpoint. And they made it perfectly clear. They said, we've got to have disarmament. And we, we know that you can't get disarmament from a position of weakness. The, the game of war seems to be the atomic war. And this is entirely a new kind of war, because in the war of the decimeters of war, muscle and cunning, when you eye. But when you came to the gun, in a duel, whoever could squeeze his gun without jerking his gun for a good aim, if his bullet, whoever bullet got away first, the only bullet got away. The other bullet didn't get away. So on the game of guns, the preemptive, whoever fired first, will usually have the great advantage. But suddenly you had the atomic bomb. And you had World War I, our limit of firing guns was five miles in the Navy. We had a big berth that the Germans had of 14 miles. But suddenly, World War II, you got your buzz bomb and then in, into the rocketry. And in the meantime, you then had this extraordinary atomic bomb. And it came to the point where Khrushchev and Eisenhower were both advised by their military. It was the first war in history <laughs> where both sides not only would lose, but lose completely. They said the point was that the rocketry could move at 14,000 miles an hour, but the radar operated 186,000 miles a second. So we have a new western where the bad man fires, and then the good man has 20 minutes before it's going to get to him, so he has plenty of time to fire. They both fire and they say, I'm going to get out of the way now. Then they find out new kind of bullets to follow wherever they go. They have now 15 minutes left, and they said, they both put up their temporal warfare, and they have 12 minutes left, and they put up their, oh, their biological warfare. By the time everything hits, everybody loses. <coughs> it's absolutely clear. It's the first war in history where both sides would have to lose completely. Therefore, Eisenhower and Khrushchev met in, in, in Switzerland, having talked about the useful, alternate uses of the atom, peaceful use of the atom. We have what went on, however, <coughs> was a building up of the atomic bombs. And the Russians kept up with that game, but they didn't like it. They said, we, we, know, we, we know it can't be used. <coughs> I'll, I'll tell you what went on, it's a really a very shocking thing to have to learn. The United States kept, kept on with this atomic bomb program, because to start off with, when Einstein was sent by the other scientists to tell Franklin Roosevelt, as being the only scientist that he would really dare to believe, that the Germans were working towards the atomic bomb. And Roosevelt then didn't credit Einstein. They put out $80 billion <coughs> of, of that kind of money, which would be way up in the trillions today, and $80 billion. Subsequently, the government put up $70 billion more. This was our, our own private money of the, of the individuals to raise their taxes. With the big oil, big energy, we have the, it starts with J.P. Morgan, when Edison developed electrical <coughs> generation and, 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 and Tesla, and it, on the distribution of electrical energy. We realized that whoever really controlled energy really did control power. But along came oil, as something even more immediately that which you would ignite in order to make your power. But both of them are fed a set of wires and meters that people have to pay things. All their energy can only come to people over wires, wires and pipes, and always going through meters. We have then big oil realizing that it's going to eventually run out of oil, and realizing that the incredible new energy source has been tapped with the atomic bomb, and wanting them to really take it over. In the meantime, capitalism, capitalism did the following. First place it gave up, it's given up land altogether. Capitalism won't, won't rent anybody anymore because they want to pay, force people to buy the unloading land and physical property altogether. For a while they were in metals. But today, big capitalism is only one thing, know-how. 
and as fast as any young man or woman graduates in engineering and so forth, they immediately taken into the invisible world of the specialists within one of the great corporations, and nobody knows what goes on from there again. We have then <coughs> the enormous army of people that developed the atomic bomb. They want to be able to take over that know-how, so they kept the atomic bomb program going without announcing to America that they're going to produce 130 <coughs> atomic energy plants. <coughs> America, America's people were never consulted on this at all. And so the, the, the bomb program was simply a cover-up for the, the enormous amount of atomic work that went into setting up 130 atomic <coughs> energy plants. This is where I find scientists themselves being so specialized really have no chance to operate even morally about it. They don't know what's going on. Now, this is how we got into such extraordinary atomic war program and how why the bombs are there today. Russia then said we're not getting anywhere on the atomic bomb sign. If we're ever going to have this armament, which we intend to do, we can't hold our people together any minute longer. <coughs> we're going to have to go into conventional military. We're going to go into Navy, Army, tanks, so forth. I'm not going to be very much longer if you're worried about the time. Are you worried about time, sir? No, she just said that. The, right. She just said to turn the lights on if you want. I, I will not be too much longer now. No, she just said that for him to tell him he can turn, turn the, lights the lights on. on. Yeah. Oh, oh, very good. <coughs> the <coughs> Russian got to the point now where they have one cent half a century they've been promising. They said about they had no navy at all. They now have three times the navy, four times the tank strength, and an enormous amount of, of divisions. <coughs> so I, <coughs> in uh, Washington D.C., it's about a month ago. Is it about a month still correct? Two. Six weeks. That made was I was asked to. We had our world game, and we had my world map. I've shown you. But 65 feet long is one to two million, one to two million scale. <coughs> the fortunately, the United States Air Force World Jet Navigation Charts are done polyconic in such small increments that we were able to take their pieces and put them in my, in my triangles. Where just the bringing the edge together, you would not notice it. We were able to fit them into those, their increments, which is so relatively small to the of the Earth that they fitted in the map for the time being. I was able then to have a world map out there where one inch was 32 miles. And on this, I was able then, with models I showed you, the mechanical models that make the people satisfied, that there was no visible distortion in relative shape or size. At, this, at the scale that we were looking at it, you could see anything a jet navigating pilot could see, there's no cloud cover. You can see a town of only 5,000 people. You see all the highways, all the railroads, the whole works for that. <coughs> On it, <coughs> I took off my shoes and walked around. My, oh, I said, uh, what, one inch is 32 miles. <coughs> so one mile is a 32nd of an inch. Mount Everest, six miles high, would be six 30 seconds, or three sixteenths of an inch. That's the highest thing in the whole mount uh, and the deepest ocean. So just the waviness of the paper, you were absolutely satisfied the flatness of the way it really looked. My eyes have walked around to 2,000 miles of altitude by seeing what you would see from, a, from <coughs> a satellite going around. My ankles were the height of the Columbia going around the world. The moon would be at a height of 70-story building, and people have seen plenty of those. The sun, at the scale of one to two million, was 25 miles away. I had this in the Sheridan Ballroom in Washington, D.C., where they have the inaugural balls. <coughs> and it was very extraordinary and impressive to see that thing there. And people really felt very goose fleshy because they could see their own little town, and they knew it was not distorted. And, then, and, there's, and even the scale with, with celestial markers of sun and, and moon. So they began really going around, and, and uh, you can see they've got very goose flesh here, really feeling it. <coughs> On that map, I was then able to find that the average t 
total devastation with an atomic bomb, and then at different sizes. But the average was five sixteenths of an inch. So we found those <coughs> something called bingo chips and bingo scoring, little red translucent filler pellets. We got 50,000 of those, and there 50,000 bombs ready to go. And Shirley is amongst those going with a sack going around, and they were scattered on, on and everywhere the, on, on the Antarctic where people would not be, the any place that people would be. And they completely covered where anybody would be, absolutely completely. It was an extraordinary dramatic realization of what, what was really waiting there. Now, so I, I said to the audience, here's Russia with this superior military capability, and, and <coughs> They're not going to wait for the United States to spend 10 years to catch up to them. Why would they wait for 10 years? They wouldn't be able to hold their people together anyway. But I've been waiting to see what would Russia do. We have, fortunately, with the computers, we have mathematical really scoring capability of very, very high order. As in a game of chess, game is mathematical, is on squares, and use known moves, geometrical moves. And in chess, you don't have to kill the king, you can checkmate him other than become mathematically indisputable, there's no way they can get out. So I said, what happened was that the Russians, without getting their name in the paper at all, were able to get the Argentine to claim the Falklands. And people began to get, have my map back on again, the ocean. Well, that's it, Don, yeah. Here are your Falklands. You're over a thousand miles away from one fraction of one percent humanity. Well, the bomb would have no use whatsoever as a threat. And you have developed a navy which is primarily a submarine navy. <coughs> and you choose winter, which is going to be very bad for the surface. <laughs> and you know that the English, then challenged, have exactly the same type navy as the United States. And you know that the United States Navy it preoccupied in Indian Ocean and Mediterranean, <coughs> protecting its own shores over here. It doesn't have anything spare to send down there at all. <laughs> so we have, the, the game went on, and, and we, you may remember <coughs> things that did not work, <laughs> didn't have to really press it very far because the computer team keep track of it. But when it was all over, the score was published because we have then Russia and the pipeline in Europe. And immediately, your great European country said, we're going to go along with Russia. It was perfectly clear in the score that America could not deliver energy to Europe ever again. So they had a showdown. But furthermore, in that score, I'm absolutely confident from the beginning that the Russians and the Chinese did not ever really part. When China went communist, the Russians immediately went to their assistance and there was great publicity about it. The Chinese were almost a billion human beings and the problems you have of five-year plans and so forth. They had to have the people Busy and, and happy. <laughs> Feel they're really getting somewhere. So, where anything like building great dams, you had people with wheelbarrows wheeling earth. And you didn't want those people to know about what you're doing militarily. And the trouble was that the Russian, the news was the Russians were giving Chinese technology, and they didn't want the people to think in terms of technology. Otherwise, it's wise people that were not put up with using the wheelbarrows, they knew they could have a tractor. So it was a very difficult thing. I think the break was to be absolutely sure that the, the that you could carry through the, the five-year planning. We're going to get into very very advanced technology and still keep 90% of human, humanity in China not knowing anything about your technology. <laughs> so that thing was necessary, but it also was very convenient to deceive the the capitalist world and that they were they were both each other. But anyway. No sooner did this scoring go on that I told you about, then China and Ru Russia announced they're getting together again. 
In other words, the scholar is quite clearly to me out that the narratives are through. Now, this may seem worrisome. What is going on in evolution here is very, very important. We've got to learn to do so much at so little. If you really might read my book, A Critical Path, and I really am a very, very well informed student of my subject, my doubt. <coughs> We now have the capability, technologically, to take care of all humanity within a 10-year design revolution. If we melted up the metals going, they're going into weaponry. Within 10 years, we'd have all humanity living the highest standard anyone's ever known. Now, all of our revolution before you had pulling the top down eventually, on basis not enough to go around to get everybody, there's only a few going to survive anyway, but you're going to keep everybody way down here. And after the World War II, you saw all the Russians wearing peasant clothes, but they're not the leaders, so they're not doing it anymore. Because <laughs> the entirely new game is, is, is going to be pulling the bottom up to high sound than anybody ever known. Nature's intent on letting the technology do the production. The way we have the game with trying to keep jobs, given <laughs> that running machinery only eight, eight hours. <laughs> well, we see that technology going to, to go into production, taking really care of everybody. We're going to find the computer is going to make it very clear it's going to pay handsomely to pay everybody handsomely to stay at home. Mm. The kind of operation you're in on is, is going to be very much favored by what we're going to go on here. Anyway, what is going on above all is the end of nations. Mm. Nature's intent on giving up all nationality. Mm. We have everything we call a nation is simply Human beings have been isolated geographically a long period of time where those who survive under those particular geographical conditions have only others who also survive to inbreed. And so, you know, you take two fast running horses, you inbreed them, you're liable to get another faster running horse. So you get people who get on better in that condition. Russia, Russia has 148 nations where people really look quite different from one another <laughs> to integrate, simply for long geographical isolation. That's all there is about nations. So we're, what we're in for now is a development of a world people. And the meeting you're having here is simply, absolutely symptomatic of a, of a world people really coming together and, and getting ready to take over and operate this world. But we're going to see complete elimination of nations. So as we, we see the unfamiliar go, and nothing is, nothing is more difficult for evolution to cope with than the United States. Dictators can make deals with other dictators out consulting the people. Hmm. Dictatorial parties, as the Communist Party, could make a deal with others without consulting the people. But the United States is a quasi-democracy. Hmm. Actually, the number one in the oath of office of taking the presidency hmm. is to defend the sovereignty. If the president ever talked about giving up the sovereignty, he'd be immediately impeached. Hmm. So nature is simply bankrupting the United States and so forth. I, I like you all to think very thoughtfully of all the people involved in these big patterns are not really aware of them. I don't have any good and bad people, and I don't think you can do any good thinking if you, if you approach problems on that basis, which you suggested, one of you suggested this talk this morning. You did. We have here an rate of acceleration. I like to, sh I don't have that curve here, I'm sorry. That's, uh, I'm going to give you a curve, which is a very important curve to help you understand acceleration. <coughs> I wondered for a long time whether I could find any basic curve of science and its accomplishment in, against time and its effect on society. Well, within the world of science, we have, when you speak of some kind of pure science, but within the world of pure science, we have the isolating of chemical, isolating of chemi chemical elements and that one single thing, isolating a chemical element. When history opens, we have nine chemical elements already been isolated. We don't know when it was done, but they're already in use. Gold, silver, mercury, tin, lead, zinc, <coughs> mer copper. On much, I found the first known isolation of chemical element by, by a human being is in Italy in 1200, arsenic. I made a chart 800 years long, from 1200 A.D. to, 8, to 2000 A.D. 
on the shot, every time I saw you came to Elementary, you went up one step. So I started nine steps high, <laughs> and uh, Osnick brought it up one <coughs> step. There was a 300-year lapse, and then we came to antimony. Another 75-year lapse, and we came to phosphorus. From there on, it grows one every two years, average. As it goes from there on, there are very clear accelerations and there are slowdowns. And the accelerations are always peacetime, and the slowdowns are always wartime. I often said that science prospered in wartime, but, it, but it's a product of science of yesterday, because they quite clearly, the pure discoveries of isolation have been found in the peaceful times. Anyway, on that chart, then here is this curve of acceleration going up to here. 1932, which you call the depth of the Depression, is when we made the 90-second isolation. Not, not coming on in 1992, but it's we now had a shelf full. For the first time, we take the atoms apart in their fundamental way, and then they're on the shelf and be recombined preferred ways. From there on, we have the post-uranium split-second split light. These, all these elements in here, none of them come in by the number. They say coming on with number 38 might be 70 seconds to be isolation, and the number 92 might have been well, it was much earlier, whatever it was. Uranium. Anyway, from 1932 on, they come in actually by the number. So, can we all remember 98 is 98th isolation and 100 and 100 and so forth? It's absolutely so. It's a strange new curve and all split second. Now, on that chart, where I have then the fundamentals of pure science against time, there's no question about it, because your, your membership is absolutely clear. One electron, one proton, two electrons, right by the number, and they, all the numbers have to be filled. So it's, it's really self-excluding of all the things that are relevant. Now against that background, I said, we finally developed technology, and from technology we begin to develop improvements in the environment. <laughs> Makes it possible for us to live where you couldn't live before. Naked, humanity having always been born naked, helpless, ignorant, unclothed. So, I said, I'm going to, against this chart here, have humanity demonstrate to me capabilities to develop environments where they could get inside the environment control and they could exist under conditions they never could exist before, while at the same time controlling energy operative outside of the environment control to take them in one complete circuit of the Earth. That would just be a standard requirement. So I found then, suddenly it was Magellan, a little wooden sailing ship. An environment you could get into and could, could take the great seas and control the winds outside taking around. 